right, welcome back to the uh, FCPU tutorial series. Here I'll be covering part four, and this will be covering all the different conditionals and uh, control flow related uh, functions. So, for those who don't know, conditions, what I'm referring to here is like if else statements, jumping, uh, blocking, you name it, it's all gonna be covered here uh, in this tutorial. So it's gonna be kind of a longer video. All right, so first thing I wanna get into is labels and the uh, jump command. So a label is kind of like when you would define a, a function in a normal programming language. It's kind of a uh, little location that you uh, save in your uh, text that something can jump to. So like jumping to uh, continue or to the call or whatever, if you say you jump to that label, the pointer or whatever we're currently at will just skip over everything and just go to that point. So that's very useful uh, for going to different uh, functions or little snippets of text, well, of commands that you want to do. And uh, I'll cover the uh, load uh, effective address or LEA command uh, shortly, and I'll, I'll go over how that can uh, allow you to reuse functions. But uh, first, just going to give you a little demo here of uh, jumping to a little label that I call meow, just because it's the thing that came off the top of my head. And all, yeah, and also all labels start with a colon. So if you're wondering why there's a colon at the beginning, that lets the uh, interpreter here uh, that FCPU runs on know that that's actually a label rather than a uh, variable command or whatever. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, go through one step. As you can see, the little arrow here has disappeared and has gone way out of the way because I put it at the very bottom, right here. So here's a little label, meow, because, <laughs> you know. And uh, what I'm gonna do is gonna move into register eight, a Spidertron, because that's what Spidertrons do, especially when they're hungry. So, I'm gonna put a Spidertron here, it says meow. And then we're gonna jump back to continue. So we uh, resume the uh, little tutorial here. So, goes right back. So as you can see, it went to a continue, and it doesn't stay on the label. By the way, when you go to uh, when you go one tick down or one step uh, on the jump command, it doesn't just stay on the label. It goes to the very next uh, instruction. Even if there is another label that's gone past, it just ignores those. So in this case, there's the next command here, which is uh, LEA or load effective address, and LEA is very useful. Uh, what happens is, is instead of, um, because your registers can't store actual text, they can only store uh, values. If you want to uh, store a label address for uh, later use, say you want to uh, jump to something later on that you're not going to use right now, but you want to uh, say uh, jump to that and you want it to be kind of variable, you can use a load effective uh, address to save the line that that uh, label is stored on. So in this case, call one would be uh, toggle, would be toggle, toggle, uh, would be uh, line 13. But uh, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna demonstrate a uh, little call here. So say I jump to the call one function instead of continue. Uh, what would happen here is that it would first store, it would, I would go into this function. And first what I'm gonna do is I'll store the uh, next function of where to return to Okay, <clears throat> and what will happen is it'll get the line 18 in this case because that's where call 2 is going to uh, have me uh, return to. So like I said before, it doesn't return to the actual uh, location. Oh, sorry, it doesn't return to the actual location of the uh, line. I'm sorry, the label. It goes to the uh, next instruction afterwards. Sorry about that. Okay, so the reason why this is useful, I'll show you real soon, is... We just uh, loaded that right here. We load the line of where to go next uh, later on when we need it. So now I'm going to go to jump to a function. So say I'm going to use this function a whole bunch of times. You want to reuse this function in many different uh, locations throughout your script. So as opposed to meow, which only goes to the continue uh, label, which is one specific location, and you really can't reuse it because you can keep calling different functions uh, you can keep jumping to the same location, but you're still going to return to the same point. So if you wanted to, wanted to call something and then 
return and then return to a different point uh, dynamically, that's where you use the uh, load effective address function. So what I'm going to do now is I'll first jump to the uh, func function right here. And what will happen is I will uh, increment, you know, just do something. So in this case, increment uh, register 5. You know, just, you know, do stuff, just a little placeholder to say, okay, if I had a function, I was doing stuff. You know, I go through the function, do whatever it is you want. And then when you're done with the function, it says go to the next label slash location. So this is how you return back to where you started from. So instead of, uh, yeah, just like you saw with meow, instead of having to go to a fixed location like with continue, this time, since it's stored in uh, memory, jump to R7, right? It's going to say jump to that line. Okay. So now that we're done with this function, we can dynamically just go back to uh, the next function here. So I said, okay, go to this after I'm done with, uh, you know, function or whatever. So now we're in the uh, next call, call two, and I'm going to store this again to say, okay, here's where to go next. All right. So what will happen is I'll uh, go through the function again. I'll say load effective address test, and it'll just go down to here. But you could just you could have this control flow go anywhere you want in your script. But this is the way that you can dynamically tell your functions, uh, tell, well, tell your script where to return to so you uh yeah you can automatically redirect things on the fly and you don't have to worry about like a bajillion if else statements or something of where you uh return to you can just store the line of where you want this thing to go next into a register so just going to store the uh, test label first 27 because that's where this is going to go down to and now I'm just going to go through the function again, do some stuff from that func because I want to call func from here, I want to call func from here, whatever. So you want to use it a bunch of times, go use it again. And of course it just increments it, big whoop. And now it says, okay, return to wherever. Okay, so now that this is done, go to where I wanted it to go, or, you know, to the next thing. In this case, it's defined as test because that's line 27. And now we go to the testing uh, section. Okay, so now moving on to the uh, section on test commands. Uh, testing commands are mostly like if true, do this. Otherwise, just keep on going is what uh, you should usually use them for. Don't use them for uh, like your classic if-else statement where you can actually um, tell the thing to do a whole bunch of stuff if it's true or do a whole bunch of stuff if it's false. Uh, basically, this is like a little, um, this is just to check if something's true, do this one-liner command, including uh, like jump to like a whole label or something like that if you want something more complex if it's true. But uh, we'll be getting into branching, and so you won't even need to use, uh, t for some, you don't even need to use something like test if you want something more complex. Uh, testing commands, uh, like testing if something's less than, greater than, equal to, whatever. Like I said, this is only for like one-liners. So if it's true, you know, do something. Otherwise, just keep on going. So I'm going to have a uh, counterexample here of what not to do. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, test if R1 is less than R2. 1 is, in fact, less than 3, so this will be true. And, of course, it's going to send a green signal into the third register. But, unfortunately, now you are, once, once the true uh, value is done with, it goes immediately to the next line. So, that's the thing here. Like I said, this is for one-liners. You don't want to, or you don't use a, uh, don't use this as an if-else statement. Just use this as an if statement. So, if true, do this little... A single action otherwise just continue because what it'll do if it's true it'll do an action then continue if it's false it'll just continue so yeah and just to show you that okay if it's true unless you're doing something more advanced where it jumps over which you're not going to need I'll show you that real soon uh, you're gonna end up with a problem like this so yeah just remember this is only good for one-liners all right
the one line true commands. If true, do this, otherwise skip. This isn't an if else statement, this is just an if statement. All right here, so just remember, don't treat it like uh, like this. Yeah, this is a little counter example here. Okay, so I'm just gonna clear out register three, so we get rid of that. And now I'm just gonna go over the other type of test, which is testing by the type. So the value types are your typical, like less than, greater than, equal to, not equal to, stuff like that. That's what your normal tests are. That's your value related uh, tests. And then there's this two other commands here for testing by type, which is, is it where you compare two different registers? Uh, I'm gonna go right here. And it doesn't, remember when you're dealing with uh, type related commands, value doesn't matter. So I'll just keep these here as little dummy variables. These, uh, this two and five, it could be zero. It could just be the, values of the, uh, I mean, it could just be the signals themselves, like this could be zero, this could be zero, won't matter. All it's gonna do is compare the actual types. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is just test if R1 has the same type as R2, in which case it doesn't. And yeah, so in this case, this would work, but it would be absolutely worthless because, yeah. What I'm saying here is, uh, yeah, in this case, it does work out as anticipated if this was an if-else statement because I'm going immediately to else, but yeah, uh, this is just like a little reinforcement of what I said here uh, previously. So yeah, it just tested if the types were true, were the same or not. Uh, TAD, which is the opposite of test if it's uh, the same as, just says if they're different. So these are actually different, so that register true. And once again, this is just another one of those little one-liner test uh, commands. So in this case, it was false, so yeah. All right, so anyways, uh, going to branching. This is the same as a test command, but it allows you to jump if something is true. So you can jump to a label and do something that's much more advanced. So BLT is the same thing as TLT which is uh, what, I, uh, what we just did right here. But instead of doing one line and then going off to the next, what this is gonna do is going to basically teleport. So I'm gonna say branch, if, this is, if R1 is less than R2, which is going to be, uh, go to function true, you know, just jump to this label, uh, true, which is right down here. And as you can see, it's going over the skips and all this other stuff. And that way you can go and have access to much more, uh, like far more commands. So if you wanted to do something, if it was true, if you had like a whole list of different actions, branch branching is the way to go. Branching is definitely the way to go for anything that's more advanced than the simple uh, true statement. If you want to test if something's true and skip otherwise, use your test. Uh, if anything, if it's more complex than then just doing something if it's true, if you want to do like a whole bunch of stuff if it's true, if you want to do a whole bunch of stuff if it's false or both, anything complex, branching is the, it, it, branching is your friend. Always go to branching. So I'm uh, gonna go here, branch is gonna be true. I'm gonna skip over to uh, the true label right now. And right, you know, what I'm gonna do is just move a green signal into R1, just like a little dummy thing for if it's true. There we go, and we did some stuff. So now jump back to uh, the ne next uh, <coughs> thing here in the statement. So if you wanted to continue after the false statement, as opposed to the, the uh, test statement, instead of going through the true statement and then the false statement, what you can do here is you can put your little, uh, put a little return address where you're gonna go to. In this case, it's gonna be called push. So now that this was true, jumped here, you know, this jumped out, skipped over this, went through this, and now going back, it skips over so that this is never executed, if it's true, as opposed to what your testing does. So this is gonna just jump to the uh, push command. And now I'm gonna say move the green signal uh, in R1 into the output. And in this case, it's gonna be output one. Doesn't really matter, but. 
There we go. We have a green light. Woo. So yeah, <coughs> that's what's uh, going on there. So it worked. Anyways, jump can also be useful for skipping over sections of code that you already uh, put in. So instead of stuffing a whole bunch of uh, functions that you're only going to use once or aren't going to be immediately executed one after another, if you want something, if you don't want to have something go from like top to bottom and not jumping around at all, which you want, if you were doing that, you wouldn't need conditionals whatsoever or almost whatsoever. You would only do like testing, I would say. But if you do want to jump around and make your stuff more advanced, jumping is uh, one way of skipping over blocks. So the true statement that we just did here, this little function that we just used, uh, so you don't want to reuse that function. You just want to execute true. This could be at the very bottom. This could be wherever in your code. And now you just want to return and never have to see this thing again. Or just not do it immediately afterward. Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to have this little jump command to skip over this uh, block called skip me. And it's just going to skip over to uh, this version. Uh, sorry, all right over here to uh, skip me. Alrighty. So we just did that, and I sk we skipped both this uh, block that was just executed as well as another block that uh, will be executed real soon, as you'll see. And now this just wanted to show that jump can also be, uh, <coughs> you can also put offsets at the end of uh, jump. So you can use positive or negative numbers. And what will happen here when you use an offset is it'll jump to true. And if it's negative, it'll just go a few lines up by those many lines. So like negative two would go up or I think it would go either one, two or one, you know, two commands or something like that, forget. Um, and in this case, it's positive, so it'll be going downward. So it's going to go to true, and it's going to skip two lines. So skip this line, skip this line, and now it'll execute what we didn't execute before. So this is only the only way to uh, currently access it because you don't have uh, a little label here. Yeah, kind of a little neat way of doing some stuff. All right here, so just skipped it to true, down two lines. And now I'm just going to move a uh, cyan signal into the output and turn the light cyan. Yay. And now I'm going to jump to skip me again, but this time it's going to go past uh, the true statement. So, yep. So jump to skip me plus four lines. So, yeah, okay, it is four actual text lines, not actual commands here. So your offsets deal with literal lines including night space I think and since it yeah so since I have a uh, offset here all I need to do is just yeah uh, sorry is just uh, skip past a command line and then once I'm here in this text it'll just keep going past it and now we're here at the next command so yeah if you're using a uh, offset just remember you only have to worry about like the effective lines I mean like this uh, skip a jump command right here when you want to skip past something and they'll ignore all your white space and text. So now we're here at blocking. Alright so now we're getting into the little more um, external IO related uh, conditionals here where this is mostly used for like interfacing with different um, combinators and other external uh, inputs. So what the blocking signals do is basically pauses so you know, I can do whatever. I can say play, I can say skip, I can do you name it. It's just not going to uh, do anything here. It's going to stay here until this condition is met. So what BKG stands for is uh, block or pause until a certain count is uh, reached on the green wire. The uh, reason why it's K instead of C, uh, my guess is because the... Uh, because con STG is uh, Russian, and in Cyrillic, there is no C. Uh, if you see a uh, letter that looks like C in the Cyrillic alphabet, that's actually pronounced like an S. So the only thing that is similar to a C is uh, K or K. So block until count, and then green wire. And if you want the red wire, it would just be BKR. 
So in this case, it's going to be at least one signal is on the green wire. So I could have one, I could have four, I could have like a whole bunch, but there's going to be at least one green signal to uh, come in. Now I don't have any green signals here. So what I'll do is I'll just use this little constant combinator as a uh, little input that's connected to the green wire. And here I'll just demonstrate it doesn't have to be exactly one uh, signal in order to execute. It could be one, it could be two, it could be a thousand, whatever. But it has to be greater than the amount that you uh, give it. So click. There we go. And it just went through. Now, of course, we have the uh, memory here. You know, I just it received this on the input. And then it also put this into the uh, memory channel as well. Because after executing blocking, I use the uh, little xmove command, as you might have uh, seen me demonstrate earlier, an earlier video, of how to take everything on a single wire and then pop the thing into a memory buffer. So that's what happened. So uh, this is actually very useful with uh, blocking commands because like it says here, the uh, blocking commands uh, execute any kind of uh, command that immediately follows a blocking command executes in the same exact tick as the blocking command. So once something re receives a signal or a whole bunch of signals, uh, the moment that, uh, say, this whole bank of signals here, which uh, triggered it, once this triggers your blocking signal, I mean your blocking uh, command, this is immediately executed afterward. So that way, if your inputs are changing like a bunch of times, say this is like looping through like one to a thousand or something like that, and uh, what, and, yeah, and the state that it was originally triggered in is, as you see right now, where the solid field is equal to one. What will happen is, is once once this right here triggers it, even if these singles are changing, like immediately afterward, it'll still take that snapshot of the signals that uh, triggered it. So that's very useful. You just take an immediate snapshot. It's not subject to things constantly changing all the time. So yeah, it's, it's pretty useful if you're sending like a whole packet in just one pulse. When I say packet, like a whole bunch of different signals all in one shot. It'll just take, take an immediate snapshot the moment that thing gets triggered. Uh, so if you're pumping a bunch of different signals with different uh, types, different values, stuff like that, it's only going to capture the very first one that you uh, send to it. So that way you can have things dispatched to multiple different combinators, and this one only listens to and grabs the signals from what is uh, triggering it, rather than a bunch of other arbitrary crap that would come afterward. So yeah, that's what uh, is really useful with the blocking uh, signals as well. So you can immediately capture stuff. Kind of like Shenzhen IO, if you play that game, <laughs> I would uh, recommend that. Alrighty, so here's another version of the blocking signal. Instead of uh, based on a certain count or a certain number of signals on a uh, wire, what this is gonna do is it's just gonna pause, You know, it's gonna block until a specific type of signal, regardless of value, or regardless of the number of counts of a signal uh, are on a wire. The only thing it looks for is if a given type is somewhere within that whole uh, morass. So I'm going to leave this open right here. So we'll have a whole bunch of these other inputs still going on. And I'm going to put here an addition onto the green wire, this right here which is going to uh, satisfy the condition for, you know, look, looking for a signal that has a long inserter as the type. There we go. And it was immediately executed. So, yeah, I have a whole bunch of other signals in here and doesn't care about that as long as there's at least one signal with that type. It will immediately it'll execute regardless of any of the other clutter that you might have in here. So this is good for saying uh, say, for example, you want to use this as a way of um, telling, let's say you have like a bunch of different little uh, FCPUs or a bunch of different combinators, and you only want to capture one that has like a certain uh, color uh, on it. So that color would act as a flag to notify like, oh, only send it to this, CP this uh, FCPU because I want it to uh, 
do a certain uh, thing and never act on anything else. Well, this is one way that you can uh, listen for that signal that would be specific to this uh, current combinator and ignore any other traffic that comes in on it, on the uh, wires. And as you can see also, it uh, moved here into R6, yeah, yeah, one I. And then the very same uh, tick, because it didn't only ticked, uh, I mean, only stepped once, and it went immediately past this, and the same tick executed this, and now we're here. So yeah, this is just like a little dummy thing here. Uh, move, you know, a I signal with a value of one into R6, just as a, you know, reinforcement thing of, yeah, that's exactly what it does. It executes the same exact tick. Okay, so this is the uh, last version, which is a little cryptic in the documentation, if you take a look, where it says block while reference register has same value as in uh, green, red, both wires, or whatever. After the value was changed, assign a new value to the register and continue execution. So what will happen here is it's going to be listening right now uh, on the wires. In this case, it's going to be the green wire. BTGC is for the uh, green wire. And I'll be listening for a signal on this wire for a I signal in this case. And what I'll do is I'll wait till the input, in this case the screen input wire, I'll wait till a signal with the same exact type, in this case I, is going to wait till this signal right here changes. So the moment that this goes to uh, this value of 1 for this I signal, the moment it goes to like 0, negative 5, positive 5, 1000, whatever, when as soon as this value is no longer the same as this value, this will then uh, be uh, triggered and then I'll execute this and go to the next thing. So that's all it does. It just waits for this value to change. So, yeah, you could also do this with like your little flags, you know, your color flags uh, to wait for a different mode or some kind of instruction to come in. Say you want, you have like a different uh, state or something for your LTN or some stuff like that. All right, so what I'm gonna do here, because I'm lazy, is I'm just gonna turn this signal off so that I goes from a one to a zero because it'll no longer exist and boom turns it blue so yeah i just immediately executed this uh argument here and yeah so as you can see on the green input wire these don't exist so it might as well just be read as a zero i could say this would be uh negative i could also set it to i'm not going to go through all that because i don't want to go through triggering these other uh, blocking signals and all that crap okay but uh yeah that's how this would work and that's the end of it. I have a BKR here just as a way of stopping this thing so it doesn't go through the uh, meow script and continues <laughs> all over again. So, yeah, we are at the end of the tutorial. Um, yeah, uh, I think there's other things as well to go through, but that's going to be for later on. I'm going to pass that. These little control signals here, uh, these are these are more like just external controls rather than conditionals. Uh, I'll be covering that after I cover the uh, memory commands. And then after uh, doing stuff from the outside, I'm not going to just be doing the control signals here because there's only just a handful. But I'm also going to be uh, going through like how to interface with different things like hybrid loops and how to use combinators and the speed of the combinators to iterate through things because uh, the FCPU uh, doesn't go as nearly as fast as a combinator does. But at the same time, a combinator is pretty stupid. So you want to if you want to have best of both worlds, you create a hybrid and uh, I'll show you how to do that too in the external controls video, which is going to be after the next one. So the next one, the, say the uh, part five, uh, which is going to be right after this one, is going to be on memory. So we, uh, explore the different stuff for manipulating memory and then after that I'll go into the uh, how to interface with stuff uh, outside of FCPU. Okay well uh, thank you for watching this uh, tutorial and I'll see you next time.